Amen. Thank you very much. Acts chapter 3. Pray for uh, Brother Tim and uh, the family. They'll be with Pastor Ray Sunday, all day. And uh, so pray for their trip and their service there. Acts chapter 3. The Bible tells us as believers, we are on display for the world to see. And we, that, you don't have to like that. that that's the way it is. And uh, really, when you hear someone say, well, I just don't want to live in a, in a fishbowl. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to. Because the world watches you. The scripture tells us, and you're not at this text, but 1 Corinthians 4, 9, the Bible said, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And the word spectacle there means a theater or a public show. In other words, <clears throat> they are watching us and how we live and what we do. And, uh, God, and by the way, that's one reason why we got left here after we got saved. If that were not the case, he could have taken us to heaven right away and uh, gotten us out of our misery here on this earth. But he left us here for a reason, for a purpose. And that is that we could be a light in a dark world. And so <clears throat> we are a spectacle. In our text, a crippled man is lying at the gate of the temple and he's watching. Uh, much like the, the message from Sunday night from John chapter 5, he was watching the so-called religious people come and go, watching them pass him by to worship watching to see if anyone is interested in him, he was watching. He was actually watching the worshipers. And I want us to talk about that tonight. Look, if you would, at verse 3. Verse 3, the Bible says about this man who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask alms. So here was this guy watching the worshipers. And, and I think tonight, in light of the fact that we are truly under investigation by the world, what are some things that we need to be careful about? We are being observed. People do watch you. If you have any kind of testimony, if you are a Christian and people know it, I hope that's the case. Uh, we, uh, we grabbed a bite to eat a while ago and the young girl got ready to leave. She said, have a blessed, have a blessed night. And I asked my wife, I said, I wonder if she says that to everybody or if she kind of picked up that might help her get a good tip uh, from us. But, but they do. They watch. Uh, they, they watch where you go. They watch what you do. They watch everything about you. And so from this passage tonight, we're going we're gonna to look at uh, these men and uh, this man and see if we can learn some things that might be worthy of us making sure these things are being exhibited in our lives. Let's pray together and we'll get into the message. Father, we ask your help in these moments. We pray that you teach us and instruct us and use us in the lives of other people. And we'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, if you would, at Acts chapter 3 and verse number 1. The Bible said, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. I want you to notice one word in that verse. We'll look at some other things in a moment. But I want you to look at one word in that verse, and that is the word together. Together. Peter and John went up into the temple together. Here's the first thing I jotted down. <clears throat> we need to live harmoniously. All right? We need to live harmoniously. What are you talking about? Well, the world's watching us. We got to get along with each other, church. And I believe we do. I, I don't know of any feuds going on right now. Uh, if there's a really good one, I'll, I'll, I'll buy a ticket. Uh, I, I think we're getting along and I think we have a good spirit in our church. Uh, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that people do watch to see if we can get along with one another. One of the great deterrents uh, to us reaching other people could very well be how we as Christians treat other Christians. I believe this, and, and I'm not going to get into this tonight, but I believe this. I believe that a lot of people have been turned away 
from whatever you want to call it. Let's, let's, we'll use the term fundamentalism, uh, and I'm a fundamentalist, and I'm an independent Baptist, and I'm not ashamed of any of those things. But, but I think a lot of people have been turned away from fundamentalism because of how fundamentalists treat other people. Yeah. We can have the right position and maintain a godly disposition. That is possible. You do not have to be a jerk to be a fundamentalist. You don't have to be some kind of jerk to be a Bible-believing Christian. And we ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to be careful how we treat people, how we get along. The Bible says this. Notice with me, if you would, in John chapter 13 and verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this men shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now, now think about this. He did, here's what he said. Everyone's going to know that you are a follower of me based upon your relationship with each other. Right? I'm a separatist. But he didn't say everyone's going to know you're a disciple based on your separation. That's not what he said. It's not what he said. I'm conservative. But he didn't say, everyone's going to know you're a disciple if you're conservative enough, if you're far enough to the right. They're going to know you're my disciple if your standards, your holiness, your music, your everything about you, if it's far, that's not what he said. And those things are all important. I'm not belittling any of those, but here's what he said. He said, here's how they're going to know if you're my disciple, if you love each other, if you love each other. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So how in the world, here's the question, do we expect to ever have any impact in the lives of people out there if we can't get along with the people in here? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The world watches to see. They watch to see how we get along. They watch to see how we resolve conflicts. They watch to see how we work through struggles. They watch to see how we reconcile wrong. And it's tragic. It's tragic that too often there is such friction between us and other believers that, that, that it sends the wrong message to those who don't know our Savior. Now, the truth is, it's impossible that we never have conflict. That's not going to happen. The more people you have, the more potential conflict. The more time you spend together, uh, we're doing pretty good right now. We only spend three hours a week together. (laughs) We're doing great. The more time you're around each other, the more. You know what? You, you, you fuss and fight with your spouse, potentially, more. i got to be real careful. Uh, but, but you have the potential to fuss and fight with your spouse more than you do strangers. You know why? You're together all the time. Especially during the pandemic, man. I mean, you're together all the time. Uh, there's probably been more conflict between children or young people and their parents in the last five months than there were in the last two or three years. Why? Because we're together all the time. They're around. Everybody, they're up underneath you. They're getting on your nerves. They're driving you nuts. They're, they're, they're worrying you, bothering you, and there's potential for conflict. So we've got to understand that it's important that, hey, when we wrong, when, when, when we feel that, let's, 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 be, let's approach each other and let's be approachable. Don't, don't, if somebody comes and says, hey, can I talk with you? I feel like there's something between you. Don't get all defensive about that. People are watching us. Uh, when we do, we approach one another. We talk through things. We work to bring about a resolution. God put it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. How many of you know someone with whom is impossible? Raise your hand. All right. Number two. Number one, they're watching. They're watching us. Okay, they're watching us. Number one, 
we got to live harmoniously. Number two, <clears throat> we should love unconditionally. Verse number two. The Bible said, and a certain lame man from his mother's womb. God specifically spells out that this man is not like most other men in that he's crippled. We might use this kind of terminology. He's got baggage. Paul used this kind of terminology. He said to a group of people, you, he, or about a man, he was not ashamed of my chain. This guy, God says about this man, this certain man who was lame. Do you know that we tend to love people who are in un, uh, I'm sorry, we tend to love people who are lovable. Some people are easy to love. And some people not so much. Um, the world watches to see if we love people because of who they are. Or I'm sorry, because of who we are or in spite of who they are. Let me say it again. They watch to see if we love. I'm reading it different than I wrote it down. That's why I'm struggling. Uh, my teleprompter is not helping me out tonight. Um, the world watches to see if we love people because of who we are or in spite of who they are. In other words, we ought to love people. Why? Because we're Christian. Amen. Right? We're believers. We're, chill, we're people of God. We're his, his little children. We ought to love people, regardless of who they are, regardless of what their issue is, regardless of what their problem is, whether or not they are lovable or unlovable. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 46, for <clears throat> if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. So if someone loves me, and they make me feel warm and fuzzy, and they send me notes and give me gifts, and I love them, everybody would do that. Right? right. Even the publicans do that. If you only love people who are lovable, if you only love people who love you, what reward have ye? Everybody does that. That's what Jesus is saying here. And so I need to understand tonight that I have a responsibility, that I'm being watched, I'm being observed, I'm being measured, and that I need to love unconditionally. By the way, it is critically important that we master the art of hating the sin while loving the sinner. Amen. And sometimes I'm afraid we get, we, we get it crossed. We must, as people of God, master the art of hating the sin while loving the sinner. What about this? What about partiality? What about, what about uh, prejudice? What about respect of persons? Turn in your Bibles to James chapter 2. I want you to see this. Many of you would know this. <clears throat> James chapter 2. Verse 1. James chapter 2 verse 1. My brethren... Have not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. Okay, now here's what he's saying. Don't, don't as, a, as one who has faith, the faith of Christ, then you should not have respect to persons. Don't have the faith of Christ with persons respect to persons. He goes on and he helps us understand. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth uh, the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand you there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil things? Can I tell you what he's saying? you got to love people where they're at. You got to love people where they're at. You don't judge people based on how they're dressed. You don't judge people based 
on what they have. You, if someone comes in and they're dressed to kill and everything, every T is crossed and every I is dotted, you're good to them. And if someone comes in and they have nothing and uh, they don't look like you and they don't act like you and they don't talk like you, you love them just like you love the other person. We got to love unconditionally. We got to love unconditionally. They're watching. They're watching. This lame man is watching. Are they going to, are they going to care about me? I'm not like everyone else. I'm not like everyone else. Are they going to have time for me? First Corinthians chapter six, verse number nine, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Man, that's a terrible list. Oh, man, get me away from all those people. But what's the rest of the verse say? What's the next verse say? And such were some of you. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget where you came from. And so we, we've got to be careful that we live harmoniously, that we love unconditionally. Number three, we ought to listen attentively. I always have a hard time with that word. Attentive, attentively. Real close. That's what that means. You've got to listen real close. Peter and John are going into the temple. And this lame man is there and he's begging. And you know what he does? He asks them. He asked him for a gift. Verse 4 says, And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. You know what people need to know? They need to know that we are interested in what is happening in their lives. <clears throat> you know why? Because they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They really don't. They don't care. They, they need to know. They, this guy, have you ever... And I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a very good listener. I think that's why God called me to preach, so I would never have to listen to preaching. I'm not a very good listener. But have you ever tried to talk to somebody who is obviously not listening to you? Besides your husband. <laughs> and and they're, they're like some of you right now playing with their phones. They're, they're, they're not paying any attention. Or, or even if they're looking at you, they're already formulating what they're going to say whenever you shut up. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know people like that. And, uh, and, and you can just tell, even if they're responding to you, you can tell by their responses, they're really not interested in you. They, they really, they, 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 they don't care, <laughs> right? Man, we can't let people feel that. We, we've got to be very careful as Christian people that we listen attentive, atten real close. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 13. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. So if I'm going to make a difference, then I've got to pay attention. I've got to pay attention to the needs of people around me. I, I, I've got to I've got, to, I've got to be careful that I'm not looking without seeing or hearing without listening, but that I am engaged in what is going on in there, that I care, that I care enough to focus on their needs and, and to listen to their, their words, that, that I even care enough to listen to things that they're not even verbalizing. Everyone here has had someone tell you, I'm fine, when you knew they weren't fine. Right, And so they're watching the worshipers and they're watching to see if Peter and John are focused. Can I ask you a question? Let's just, I mean, we're just trying to help each other tonight. Do, do you really take a personal interest in the people around you? You know, people with whom you work, people, kids in your class at school or in, in Sunday school or kids on your bus route, kids in your junior church. Or, is it just that they're another number or another person? We talked about this Sunday, talking about the multitude and seeing beyond the multitude and seeing people at a personal level. Hey, I cannot, I cannot 
I cannot be that one for everyone, but all of us can be that one for someone. Right? I, I can't. Man, I, I, I work at it. I really do. I work at it. <clears throat> Trying to remember names. And, uh, and, and then I get names down. And then the kids' names. Don't come up. You guys, don't come up and ask me after service what's your name. You, some of y'all got a bunch of kids, man. I can't keep up with all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but you work at it. You want to know. You want to know, be, be invested. Right? You want to be engaged. You want to be paying attention. You want to be listening. You want to be watching. And, and, and listen to me. That is a part of us sending the right message to people. Proverbs 27, 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Can I paraphrase that? Those whom you are attempting to influence. Isn't that what a shepherd does? He's attempting to have influence. So those whom you, they may, you may not be a pastor, you may not, may not be a teacher, but if you're trying to have influence in someone's life, here's what he said. He taught us a lesson. He said, know the state of your flock. Know what's going on in their life. Be, be engaged. Listen closely. <laughs> Attentively. I just can't say it fast. Um, Number four, we need to labor appropriately. So the crippled man looked at Peter and John and expected something from them. I hear people say this sometimes. I am so tired of everyone expecting so much out of me. Welcome to the real world. Because people expect stuff out of us. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I've said this before I saw a thing one time said um, if, you want, if you want everybody to love you don't be a preacher be the ice cream man <laughs> that's a great line isn't it everybody loves the ice cream man uh, and, and sometimes and you're very gracious sometimes the expectations that people put upon a pastor are superhuman. People expect you to know that they went to the hospital, but they don't tell you. And they get mad. Of course, we haven't been doing a lot of hospital visits in a long time, but they get mad if you don't go see them or if you don't send flowers. Well, how, how am I supposed to know? Well, you're supposed to know. You're the pastor, right? That's unrealistic. But you know what? I'm not going to get bitter at that. And I'm not going to say, well, I'm not, I ain't going to care about nobody then. No, I, I, want to, I, want to, I, I want to measure up. I want to be challenged by the expectations that, that people have of me. Our good works that we perform to, toward those without are a tool that God uses them to point them to himself. And Jesus taught that in Matthew 5, 16, when he did say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So Peter here was quick to tell this man. I like this. This It's a great, great lesson. You know what Peter did right away? He quickly told him, I don't have the wherewithal to meet the need that you think you have. And by the way, it's not a bad thing. For you to be honest. It's never a bad thing to be honest. But it's not a bad thing to look someone in the eye and say, you know, I don't know that I can help you. I don't don't think I have what you need. That's what he said. He said, silver and gold have I none. That's that's, That's what this guy thought that he needed. Truth is, people expect things from us. They expect us to care and to give and to help. So, you know what we ought to do? We ought to roll up our stinking sleeves, immerse ourselves in the lives of others, and give until it hurts. We ought to, we ought to spend ourselves trying to help people and measuring up to their expectations. Don't be turned off by that. Be challenged by it. 
You understand the difference? Everybody just expects so. Okay, why don't you get busy trying to fulfill some of those? And Peter, he said, I, I don't have what you think I need, but, but, but I, I, I tell you what, I, uh, I have something. Basically, what Peter is saying to him is, I'm going to give you everything I have. I won't hold back and I won't be tentative, but please understand that I am limited. Silver and gold, I don't have any of that. But such as I have, give I unto thee. See the difference? I'm going, to, I'm going to give you everything I got. I'm going to give everything I've got. I'm going to do everything I can to meet your expectations. I'm going to do all I can to help you with your needs. And then in verse 6, of course, we see the real crux of this story. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So here's what I kind of got out of this when I was reading and studying, is that when I've done all that I can do, then I've got to trust the Lord to do the rest. Right? <clears throat> I, I, don't have, I don't have what you think I need, but I'm going to give you everything I have. And then, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to command you to rise up and walk. So we, we've got to labor appropriately. We've got to work at it. You've got to work at it. It's not easy. Getting along with people is not easy. Getting along in a marriage, building a good marriage, it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Raising kids, that's not easy. Maintaining a strong testimony in a, in a crooked and perverse uh, uh, nation, that's not easy. But we're going to give our best. Caring about people who care nothing about you, that ain't easy. Giving to people who'll take all you'll give, it's not easy. But we're going to give, we're going to understand that we're limited, and so we're going to be sure that the Lord is factored in this equation, and that ultimately He's the one that's going to have to meet the needs that people have. And then the last thing, we ought to lift expectantly. Look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So Peter reached down, took his right hand, and lifted him up. You know what I believe? I believe with all my heart that, that Peter believed this guy was going to walk. Why would he have done that if he didn't think the guy was going to walk? He, wasn't, he didn't want to be a fool. He didn't want to make a fool out of himself. And Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he grabbed him by the hand and he said, rise up and walk. And, and Peter believed he would. And you got to have faith. you got to be expectant. I mean, you you got you to have faith. you got to believe well, we've got to have faith to believe that God is ultimately going to make the difference in that person's life. We understand this tonight, that outside of these four walls, there's a world that desperately needs to know that there is a Savior. We don't have the answers. By the way, you, 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 get, you get engaged in conversation with people and they start asking you a bunch of questions you don't know the answers to. You know what? Don't try to lie your way out of it. Don't do that. If there's a question you don't know the answer to, tell them. Say, look, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, well, the guy says, I just want to know which came first, the chicken or the egg. And uh, you say, well, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question. But, uh, but I tell you what I do know. I do know what Jesus did in my life. I do know what a difference he made in my life. And I believe he would do the same in yours. And you got we, we have to we have to go about this business with faith. I'm so glad tonight there's a Savior, aren't you? I'm so glad that he he cares about people. He puts us in the path of people that he would help if he were walking here in our shoes. He he makes sure that we intersect with others that we can be a blessing to. But we have to, hey, we have to care. We have to listen, right? We got to work. We got to labor. And we have to lift expectantly. I read this story. I doubt very seriously this is true, but it's a powerful story. It illustrates 
the truth. Two brothers were playing on the sandbanks by the river, and one ran after another up a large mound of sand. But what neither of them knew was that the mound of sand was not solid, and their weight caused them to sink quickly. When the boys didn't return home for dinner, the family and neighbors organized a search. They found the younger brother unconscious with his head and shoulders sticking out above the sand. They lifted him to safety, and when they had cleared the sand to his waist, he woke up, and the searchers asked, where is your brother? And the little boy replied, I'm standing on his shoulders. And according to that story, that older brother had lifted up his brother. It cost him something. It cost him his life. And you know, if you decide you're going to lift up others, it's going to cost you something. We, we, they are watching us. Remember, he's lying outside the temple. All these religious people, all these religious people, they're, 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 he's just watching. He's just watching. And Peter and John come along. May God help us. May God help us to be that kind of person. Father, I pray you'd help us.